Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we'll have one subject, and it'll be a controversial one. We don't like to glorify brutal, evil regimes, and this man certainly fought for a brutal, evil regime, but he was undoubtedly the greatest military mind of the post-World War II generation, the greatest general who fought after World War II for any army. Von Nguyen Giap, who died recently at the age of 102. And I say he was the greatest general of the post-World War II era because in Indochina and then in what became North Vietnam, as the chief military strategist for Ho Chi Minh, he defeated the French and the United States in a 20-year period and changed the map of the world and the geopolitics of the world. Not infrequently, the greatest generals in history are on the wrong side politically, or the losing side militarily, or both. You may certainly not agree with the political aims of the Confederacy during the Civil War, but you cannot deny the military genius of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. You may certainly not agree with the Nazi political aims during World War II, but you cannot deny the military genius of generals like Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian. Von Nguyen Giap falls into that category. Whatever you think of the aims of the Vietnamese communists, you cannot deny his genius. And we'll concentrate on the two most important battles in his career. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954, which ended French colonialism in Indochina and drove the French out. And in 1968, during the Vietnam War, the Tet Offensive, which was the beginning of the end for American forces and led to the ultimate reunification under communism of Vietnam. The two battles are related, and in both cases, Giap's strategy proved victorious over a superior political enemy. To begin with Dien Bien Phu, in the later half of the 19th century, the French had colonized Indochina, Laos, Cambodia, and what is now Vietnam. During World War II, the Japanese overran Indochina, and the French were essentially driven out. When the Japanese were defeated at the end of World War II, the French looked to reestablish their colonial empire in Indochina. Unfortunately, at this time, they were opposed by the emerging communist forces of Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh and Van Nguyen Giap had been educated by the French, and they were imbued with the ideals of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. They had also learned the lessons of Marxism, which they had studied, and the victory of Communist China over the Nationalist Chinese in the late part of 1949 gave them confidence that they could overtake the French, who, just as the British, were struggling to reestablish their colonial empires. Whereas the British gave up India peacefully after World War II, the French were determined to hold on to Indochina. Giap organized the Viet Minh, which was the army of Vietnamese soldiers made up of diehard communists and many disaffected Buddhists because the French had favored the minority Catholics in Indochina at the expense of the majority Buddhists. From 1950 to 1953, the Viet Minh were basically getting slaughtered. If Giap has a weakness as a military strategist, it's his willingness to give up huge numbers of casualties. The French General de Lattre had devised effective strategies against the Viet Minh, but he died of cancer in 1952, and he was replaced by less formidable military officers. In addition, the clock was ticking against the French, who were also fighting anti-colonial forces closer to home in Algeria. Even though the Viet Minh were taking huge casualties, the French did not believe they could win a war of attrition and were looking for his final decisive battle to knock out Giap's military force. They decided to build a military garrison far from Hanoi and far from the ocean in northwestern Indochina near the Laotian border. The French strategy was threefold. They would go behind Giap's lines to protect Laos, to protect their military guerrilla allies in the mountains, and not coincidentally the opium routes, which provided the French a lot of their income, and they were hoping that Giap would have his forces try and storm the garrison at the NBN Fu. They would hold them off with crack paratrooper divisions that they landed through old Japanese aircraft landing sites, and then they would wipe them out in mop-up operations. The French had 15,000 people at the NBN Fu, and they didn't believe that the Viet Minh could mobilize those numbers. They underestimated not only the Viet Minh's strength under Giap, but their resolve. In their arrogance, the French failed to take the high ground at Dien Bien Phu, and Giap took advantage of that. He had thousands of people building roads and dragging up cannons that were camouflaged to neutralize the superior French firepower. When the Battle of Dien Bien Phu was enjoined in the spring of 1954, initially Giap's Viet Minh again took huge casualties. But Giap had them continue their campaign almost to the point of mutiny. His priority was knocking out the French airfield, which he was able to do, 
and thus prevented the French from bringing in reinforcements. Ironically, both sides were fighting with American equipment. The French had American planes, American helmets, and American guns. Many of the Viet Minh weapons supplied by Communist China were actually American weapons that had been taken from the Nationalists during the Chinese Communist Revolution. At that point, Giap had the high ground and he was able to call in reserves. He had 50,000 troops, three to four times as many as the French, who could not resupply their garrison. With the French landing strips at the NBN Phu knocked out and Giap pulling the high ground, he reassessed his strategy. Instead of full frontal assaults, he changed tactics and went to a siege. The French were now running out of supplies and they couldn't evacuate their wounded. They were essentially sitting ducks and Giap just waited for them to surrender. It took almost two months, but eventually the French did surrender and they sued for peace. The Western world was shocked that Giap's Viet Minh could defeat a major Western military power. Besides about 3,000 French casualties, another 10,000 French soldiers were put on forced march 500 kilometers and many of them died. Once the French abandoned Indochina, the Republic of Vietnam was created. A northern half under Giap's boss Ho Chi Minh, which was a communist protectorate of communist China and Soviet Russia, and a southern half, which is essentially an American protectorate under the Catholics and Ngo Dinh Diem. Giap's victory at Dien Bien Phu, one of the most important battles of the 20th century, was the end of French colonialism in Indochina and assured that at some point there would be an even greater, deadlier war down the line between the North and the South. Giap's army had been bled white by the Indochina War with the French, and needing time to recover, their main strategy for the next 10 years was to recruit insurgents in the South, the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong were allies to the Viet Minh, who were now the regular army of North Vietnam. The Americans who first supported the Viet Minh after World War II and then became wary of them with the communist takeover in communist China in the Korean War were now concerned about a total communist takeover of Southeast Asia. The American intentions were unclear for most of the late 50s and early 60s, but Giap was watching them and studying them carefully. After Kennedy's assassination in November of 1963, the Gulf of Tonkin incident in August of 1964, which many believe was a manufactured incident by the Johnson administration, was the signal that the Americans decided that they would protect South Vietnam against the North at all costs. The United States mobilized several hundred thousand troops and massive technology in 1965 and 1966, and Giap once again was called upon to take on a superior military and political force. He was uncertain how to do that, so in the first two years they avoided head-on confrontations between the North Vietnamese Army and the Americans, preferring to let the Viet Cong use hit-and-run tactics in South Vietnam. In the first two years of the war, in 1965 and 66, every time that Giap's forces took on the Americans in a head-on attack, they were soundly beaten, and once again, the North Vietnamese Army was taking on huge casualties, almost irreplaceable. But Giap realized they had several hull carts. First of all, the United States was intent on not invading North Vietnam, and he could use supply routes through Laos and Cambodia to resupply South Vietnam. That was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which the Americans could not eradicate with either ground forces or aerial attacks. Second, the Soviets and the Communist Chinese were willing supporters of the North Vietnamese, and the United States was unwilling to risk having them enter the war. Finally, Giap realized something before anyone else did. He knew that essentially the Americans were risk-averse, and while he was willing to take on huge casualties, the Americans domestically would not accept casualties even one-tenth the size of the ones that he was taking. Throughout 1966 and 67, Giap continued to take on huge casualties, and the Viet Cong were essentially being wiped out also. But America started to bleed, and public support for the war was waning. Lyndon Johnson was losing his support within the Democratic Party, and the Republicans were carping about the length of the war. Despite this, even though some high-ups in the American government were becoming skeptical and Robert McNamara resigned as Secretary of Defense, public opinion was still on the side of the war. At the end of 1967 and into early 1968, with a stable government in South Vietnam and many in the North looking to push a separate peace, Giap engaged an audacious strategy. The years before, there had been an informal truce between the North and the South during Tet, the Vietnamese lunar holiday that fell in February that year. Giap conceived a multi-pronged attack all across South Vietnam during Tet. He moved men and material down and made it appear that there would be an attack at Khe San, where there had been a brief siege three years before, with the real intent to attack all over the country, including the American embassy in Saigon. American intelligence had picked up on the ruse, and General Westmore, the Supreme Commander, was ready for it, 
on the attacks all over the country were thrown back. Once again, huge casualties for the regular North Vietnamese army. Giap despaired of the future of his army to the extent that his future as commander may have even been in doubt. But as it turned out, what was a major tactical disaster turned out to be a tremendous strategic victory. Although the Tet Offensive meant that his army took defeats everywhere militarily, the report circulated back to the United States in the first televised war, which portrayed the United States on defensive everywhere in South Vietnam, especially at the embassy in Saigon. The film report showed Marines defending the compound in Saigon, and the communists even circulated rumors that they had breached the embassy and were inside, which was untrue, but it left enough doubt in the minds of Americans that it shocked the entire country and the Tet Offensive became synonymous with an American defeat. If nothing else, the Tet Offensive indicated to Americans that their generals and their leaders had lied to them, saying that victory was right around the corner. It was clear that it was not. Television reporters who were trusted like Walter Cronkite soon turned on the Vietnam War. Despite his huge troop casualties and his leadership being in doubt, General Jap realized before anybody that he was about to break the will of the American public. This was solidified a month later when President Lyndon Johnson, the main architect of the war, decided not to run for re-election. Through the Democratic Party in turmoil between anti-war and pro-war candidates, and Giap realized and soon informed his masters in Vietnam that the Americans were no longer willing to do what it would take to win victory in Vietnam. Militarily in 1968 and 69, Jap engaged in battles that guaranteed American casualties but were of little strategic value to the United States, knowing full well the American public had lost its patience. When Richard Nixon, the Republican, won the 1968 presidential election, he changed strategies. He began peace negotiations with the North Vietnamese, while at the same time bombing strategic North Vietnamese supply routes in Cambodia and Laos. The North Vietnamese responded by drawing out the peace negotiations over years, knowing full well that now time was on their side. Giap knew that without a ground invasion of North Vietnam, which required a will and resources the United States was no longer willing to commit, they could not defeat the North Vietnamese military. The United States ended the draft, and eventually during Nixon's second term, the Watergate scandal weakened him politically so that he could no longer commit his time or resources to Vietnam. It was a foregone conclusion at that point that the North Vietnamese would defeat the Americans just as they had defeated the French at the NBN Phu 20 years before. On April 30, 1975, with North Vietnamese troops closing in on the city, the last Americans left Saigon ignominiously. The city was quickly renamed Ho Chi Minh City, part of a unified communist Vietnam. The re-education camps in Khmer Rouge would soon follow. Nevertheless, Van Nguyen Giap's military reputation was secured. The man who had little formal military training had engineered the exodus of two great military powers from Southeast Asia. He became an elder statesman in Vietnam, but it's not unusual in communist countries for people like Van Nguyen Giap to fall victim to predatory politicians and bureaucrats, political flunkies with nothing like his talents, and that's what happened to him. In the 80s and 90s, as an old man with little value to the politicians, he pretty much fell from favor. He spent a lot of his time inviting back American political and military leaders and going over the lessons of Vietnam and the NBN Phu. Giap understood better than them, in fact better than anyone in contemporary society, the dictum of the great German military theorist von Clausewitz, that war is the continuation of politics by other means. It took Harvard-educated people like Robert McNamara and West Point-educated people like William Westmoreland a lot longer to learn that, if they ever did. There have been far better military tacticians than von Nguyen Giap, and there have been generals who could secure victories by sacrificing far fewer troops. But from the standpoint of gaining political victory through the military, there have been few who were better than von Nguyen Giap. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. Van Nguyen Giap has been called in Vietnam the Red Napoleon. So we're going to close tonight with some of the music that Beethoven composed for the greatest general of the first half of the 19th century, Napoleon, a man who he alternatively reviled and revered. The March Venebre from the Eroica. Mm -hmm.